because he believes that that's right. Two things. One is that this, this is um, a cognitive achievement because it involves taking a familiar, an, a familiar empirical regularity and using it as the model for an unobserved phenomenon. You postulate an unobserved cause for a series of um, empirical regularities. Um, and the analogy that you know, Sellers uses is that he says that there's no difference in kind between this explanatory resource or explanatory achievement and um, the molecular theory of gases. Um, because the, the key claim is that the difference between the observable and the unobservable is methodological, not ontological. There is no difference in kind between things that we learn to perceive and things that we cannot as yet perceive. There's merely a difference of degree. And what happens when we postulate unobservables to explain a series of observable phenomena is that what, first of all, two things happen is that, is that one is that there's, a, there's not a straightforward analogical transposition from the observed, um, the observed original to the unobserved uh, model because we introduce an amendment, we introduce a significant amendment. In the case of thought, it's the case that when someone is thinking there is no inner voice, there is no voice going on in your head. We understand thinking as um, uh, you know, latent kind of verbal episodes, but we don't actually believe that there's someone, there's a little voice going on in someone's head. The same kind of, um, the same machinery is the point to explain um, sensations. Um, and, okay, now I need to, Number five, okay, so the key claim in the Sellers' account is that Sellers', Sellers account is two tiered. One is that he explains our capacity to have um, thoughts in terms of um, these um, linguistic kind of uh, internal episodes that have to determine a propositional content. In other words, when someone is thinking there's something going on inside them, that is linguistically structured and it's analogous to what happens when they speak but it doesn't involve any kind of speech, vocalization. Um, so what is going on then when someone has a sensation? Um, because the claim is that, um, so Sellers asked the following question, so what is common to A? Seeing that X over there is red, it's looking to one that X over there is red, and it's looking to one that there is a red object over there. These, what's interesting about these three claims is that um, it's actually difficult to identify what they all have in common. Um, the common conceptual content is that X over there is red. The common experiential content is that seeing that X over there is red. But there's a radical difference between those two levels of content. One is propositional and conceptual, the other one isn't. One is generic, because um, propositions are, uh, you know, kind of uh, universalizable representations, whereas experiences must be particulars. Seeing that X over there is red um, can't be explained in terms of any kind of uh, generic determinable. It can be cashed out in terms of propositional content, but it can't be cashed out in terms of any universal generic category. Because those categories are properly applied to types of physical object. So in other words, what is the intrinsic character of the common experiential content given that in B the object need not be red, in C there may be no object at all, and red is not a determinate particular but a generic determinable attributed to physical objects. So in other words, sensing must be of particulars. And what Sellers' account is simply that what we, we do to explain the content of experience is that once again we engage in a kind of a theoretical transposition, is that we take spatial temporal particulars, physical objects, that we've learned to recognize and individuate um, conceptually. And then we um, uh, abstract their, um, or rather kind of transpose their perceptible properties um, into um, 
non-spatial um, arrays of properties. Um, so in other words, okay, I'll, I'll, I'm running out of time. Um, Maybe five minutes. Okay, I'll, I'll wrap up. Yep, I'm fine. Okay. Um, so, consequence. What is it? Sellers, contrary to a kind of a common misunderstanding, Sellers is, is not a conceptual idealist. He's a scientific realist. And his scientific realism is also um, consonant with a realism both about thoughts and sensations. In other words, Sellers' account is that Jones is not an inventor, he's a discoverer. In other words, we had thoughts and experiences, but we had no way of thinking or recognizing our thoughts and our experiences. So, so the, the basic kind of, the, the crucial kind of um, Salarjian claim is that instead of having, instead of coming to have a concept of something because we've noticed that sort of thing, this is the classic claim, that you, you, you have this ability to notice things and then you develop a concept based on this ability. Sellers says this is completely, it's the wrong way around. In fact, it's our ability to notice things depends on our having the relevant concepts. But that doesn't mean that the things themselves are simply concepts, that their existence is entirely conceptual. What makes us conscious is not thinking or feeling, but have a concept of thinking and feeling, and our ability to recognize ourselves as conceptualizing or as feeling or sensing something. Um, and finally, um, I'll, I'll just, now, what's, there's a final kind of, the final quote, which is a lengthy quote, I'm not going to read it out, but it's, um, it's um, a quote. Now, what's interesting is that Sellers, strangely enough and unpredictably, rejoins kind of um, Bergson. In other words, there's a way of understanding Bergson's achievement, is that what Bergson has done is actually he's identified, he mistakes a legitimate account of the logic of sensation within the manifest image. The manifest image is the image of, is, is the, the kind of, the, the basic dimension of self-understanding in which we recognize ourselves as thinking and feeling beings. Bergson mistakes a legitimate account of the logic of sensation within the manifest image, and it's entirely proper, the idea that the homogeneity and the continuity of sensation, or the non-particular character of sensation, is unequivocal. For a metaphysical account of its absolute nature. In other words, Bergson mistakes a conceptual account for a metaphysical or an ontological account. He ontologizes what is in fact a category of the manifest image. And what's one of the things, that, and, and, and Sellers is basically, I'm just going to read the kind of the final, um, the final passage here, is that Sellers says that the reason we can't simply identify thoughts and sensations with neurophysiological processes is, um, one is because it's a mistake to ontologize um, the propositional con concepts are not things and the propositional content, the normative content um, that is um, articulated at the level of thinking um, can't be identified with any kind of array of physical processes. But neither can sensations be identified with um, you know, microphysical occurrences in the nervous system. Uh, and the reason for this is because, once again, actually what's strangely kind of, Seller says that the, um, the qualities that, he says that the, the um, the experience, a red sensation, the experience of a red sensation is non-particular. In other words, it can't be decomposed into um, micro-features which would not themselves be red. Okay? And in that regard, it's impossible to carry out an identification of a sensation with um, a microphysical kind of process. But however, what he says, what he, what he suggests is that we can come to understand, we can develop a new account of physical processes that would integrate um, continue what he calls sensor, which is to say manifold of intensive manifolds of sensation within the scientific image. So in other words, and the, the final quote he says, 
we must penetrate to the non-particulate foundation of the particulate image and recognize that in this non-particulate image, the qualities of sense are a dimension of natural process which occurs only in connection with those complex physical processes which, when cut up into particles in terms of those features which are the least common denominators of physical process, present in inorganic as well as organic processes, become the complex system of particles which in the current scientific image is the central nervous system. So what's striking about Sellers is that he says that instead of like um, consigning science to, um, so Bergson has kind of given a kind of a viable um, or at least a kind of a plausible um, account of what's entailed in our understanding of the structure of sensation. But instead of like claiming that um, scientific conceptualization is congenitally incapable of integrating this within the resources of physical theory, we can recognize that a revision in physical theory would allow, would it, a categorical revision in physical theory would allow us to introduce a new, new, new types of processes, new types of processes, of pure processes, which would allow us to understand um, sensations or sentience as a physical phenomenon. Yes, sir. Uh. <laughs>